The True Fertile Crescent Part 1 The Cradle of Civilization Have you ever wondered why the region of the Earth mistakenly referred to as the Fertile Crescent is neither fertile nor shaped like a crescent? Together, Iraq, Syria, and Jordan possess some of the most desolate land known to man. This region is extremely arid and was equally arid 6,000 years ago, regardless of how well irrigated the river valleys were. Dependence on irrigation alone rules out Mesopotamia's candidacy for the true biblical paradise. Land suitable for farming is sparse, and fresh water even sparser. The only area found near this alleged cradle of civilization, which is remotely fertile, is Kurdistan, with its scenic green highlands. However, Adam and Eve would have been unable to dwell in these mountains due to their frequent freezing temperatures. Some of these peaks snow year-round. The paradise of Eden displayed a distinctly subtropical climate, seeing as how its inhabitants were able to dwell without clothing or fire altogether. When we scan maps for a fertile, crescent-shaped area in the Middle East, Africa, Asia, the Pacific, or Europe, we find no such distinguishable region. That is until we cross the Atlantic and lay eyes upon the Gulf of Mexico, the very source of the miraculous Gulf Stream. These life-giving waters keep the Gulf Coast in a constant state of agreeable climate. It will be shown in this presentation that the Gulf of Mexico is the one and only true Fertile Crescent, and thus Florida, the Garden of Eden. Now enjoy. Welcome to Florida, baby. Introducing Dr. Narco Longo. There is only one consistently fertile, crescent-shaped landmass on the Earth today. This perfect crescent extends from the tip of Florida to the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. The coastline therein possesses Earth's most agreeable, subtropical climate the highest concentration of freshwater springs in the world, a myriad of abundant produce, and not to mention thousands and thousands of pyramids. The Gulf Coast, Caribbean Islands, and Bahamas display such lush vegetation and agreeable climate as to put the Mediterranean Sea and its barren coastlines to shame. The amniotic waters of the humid gulf average 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the dehydrated, chilly Mediterranean. This is due entirely to the gulf's sacred designation as the source of the Gulf Stream, the mother of all oceans, as will be discussed shortly. In this respect, the Middle East, again, comes up empty-handed. Florida is Eden. From its very inception as a European colony, Florida was likened to the Garden of Eden. In fact, on Columbus's third voyage to the so-called New World, he professed the lands he encountered around the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico to be the one and only earthly paradise. Interesting how they leave that part out of history class. 
yet endlessly subject us to Arab-centric propaganda, furthered by countries who would have virtually no global relevance, save for the fact that they erroneously claim host to the birthplace of the Abrahamic religions. Up until World War II, it was not uncommon to hear Florida professed as the original Garden of Eden, as Arab-centric propaganda had not been cemented into our school systems. Land advertisements and articles of the pre-war eras reflect a seemingly widespread acknowledgement of this fact. 1912 booklet, distributed by the Tampa Board of Trade, professed, Florida climate proves that original Garden of Eden was located there. On the 8th of February, 1910, the Tampa Tribune printed that, quote, the Garden of Eden was in Florida. The Tampa Tribune similarly printed the following on March 11th, 1919. General Richard E. Edmonds is correct. Only the extremely ignorant and supremely jealous now deny that here was the original Garden of Eden. Not only was the original Garden of Eden in Florida, much more to the point, it is still here and there are no rivals." End quote. Dozens and dozens of articles and land advertisements echo the same consensus. Mesopotamia translates to the land amidst the rivers. In Genesis, four rivers went out of Eden, the Euphrates, the Pison, the Gihon, and the Hydekel, also known as the Tigris. Of the modern Mesopotamia's erroneously attributed rivers, only the Tigris and Euphrates flow today, and the identities of the other two, the Pison and the Gihon, are entirely up for debate. Keep in mind, within the mainstream narrative, the area of Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, labeled the cradle of civilization, required extensive irrigation to render their largely barren land remotely fertile, which automatically disqualifies it from the candidacy for Eden. Another truth which is lost on scholars is the fact that these four rivers came to a single head. This feature is not to be found on any of the eastern continents. Believe it or not, it is in Lake Seminole, located exactly on the Florida-Georgia line, that we find the planet's only true four-headed river system. The four physical rivers of Eden are the Chattahoochee, Fish Pond Creek River, the Spring Creek River, and the Flint River. These four ancient names were carried to Asia on the Ark during the flood and reassigned to the four closest major rivers. This is how Eden was lost. But, the Gulf Stream persisted, and thus the same unique ecosystems of Florida took hold again, and paradise was restored. This fact was uncovered by Christian theologian and lawyer L. V. E. Calloway, Florida's Republican candidate for governor in 1936, who was ordained a Baptist preacher at only 17 years old. Calloway was sent on a mission from God by none other than Dr. Brown Landone, renowned Florida mystic and author. Landone instructed Galloway to move from central to northern Florida after initiating him into what was called the Order of Melchizedek. After relocating to the Apalachicola River area, just outside of Tallahassee, Calloway found that of the 28 trees identified in the Bible, 27 of them grew in this unique Florida River Valley. We will return to the research of E.E. E. Calloway later on. Mississippi translates to either gathering in of all the waters or father of waters. Hearing the words father and waters together should prick the ears of anybody who is familiar with Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Meso is the same phonetic root found in the words Mexico and Mississippi. Mesopotamia could justly be referred to as Mexopotamia or Missipotamia. Assuming the four rivers of Eden to be in Florida, we assert the original Nile River and its deltas, 
nicknamed the River of Isis to be the Mississippi River and its deltas. The name Mississippi actually contains the name of the Egyptian goddess Isis within it. An alternate identity of the River Nile has been entertained by a multitude of free thinkers, including some of the very first European settlers, slaves, the founders of the Mormon religion, and modern revisionist movements such as Tartaria and Old World, as well as the Black Israelite movement. At the very least, most people should be able to agree that the Mississippi River, Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean, are the mirrored equivalent to the Nile and Mediterranean Sea. The land of the crescent moon. For those not yet convinced, you are about to be. If the Gulf of Mexico is the true fertile crescent, it would thus be the home of at least one Abrahamic religion. Now, Islam actually brandishes the fertile crescent symbolized by the crescent moon and the planet Venus, the two luminaries which govern over fertility, as its primary symbol. Well, what if I told you that Islam actually originated in the Gulf of Mexico? For it was certainly present in the Americas well before Columbus's arrival. Don't believe me? Take a look at these so-called Native Americans. The Muscogee tribe of the Southeast United States, also known as Creek or Seminole, bear the same phonetic root, mus, as Muslim, as do the native Muspa of Florida. Muscogees dress in a distinctly Moorish style that well suits the Moorish architecture scattered around the southeastern United States and Caribbean islands. Not only do the Muscogee dress in what could be described as Muslim garb, but the Muscogee Confederacy even employed a crescent moon and star insignia identical to that of Turkey and Morocco. In fact, dozens of nations use a variation of the Moorish crescent, and if I were searching for the remnants of a pre-Columbian transatlantic empire in the Americas, that's where I would start. With this understanding, I'd like to show you a supposedly satirical map displaying the divvying up of America should the Central Powers have defeated us in World War I. This map was printed by Life magazine. The Ottoman Turks were explicitly given claim to Florida. Interesting, to say the least. When we examine the overtly Turkish architecture of Tampa Bay, we see this is no coincidence. What if I told you Florida actually has a turkey key sitting directly next to Mormon key? I think we should also re-examine the name of the islands Turks and Caicos, which we are told are named purely for a fez-wearing cactus, nothing to do with the Turks. New Smyrna, Florida, a 1767 Ottoman colony, is, however, legitimately named after a Turkish city. So, is this map showing us an alternate destiny or an alternate history? A little known fact, the Muscogee tribe of Florida actually allied with Montezuma, the Aztec emperor against his colonial foes. Another undeniable link between the Gulf of Mexico and a pre-Columbian Muslim empire is the fact that the language family to which the Aztec languages belong is the Otto-Mangian family. Otto-Mangian is Otto-Man. 
The crescent moons of the Gulf of Mexico are indeed Islamic in origin. Do you know where the word Caribbean comes from? It is named for the Carib people, who were native to its islands as well as the Gulf and Florida. Carib is nearly the same word as Arab, and this is no coincidence. If they had named the Caribbean Sea the Caribic Sea, the truth would likely have been too obvious. This area is perhaps most famous for piracy, which, all propaganda aside, is a largely Arabic or Semitic culture. The two most pirated areas of the colonial world were the Islamic Barbary coast of Africa and the potentially Islamic Gulf and Caribbean. The pirate cutlass was inspired by the Arabic scimitar. The word pirate comes from the word pyro, as in pyrite, meaning flaming or red. This is the same adjective from which the Phoenicians get their name, as do the Rus Vikings of Eastern Europe and Asia. This gives new meaning to names like Barbarossa, meaning red beard. The Prophet Muhammad was known to have red hair and a red beard, did he not? Ironically, Florida's 7,000-year-old bog burials, consistent with those in Europe, yielded specimens featuring European DNA and red hair. Lorenz is re-examining sections of DNA called haplogroups in the brains of five Windover people. He's looking for haplogroups found only in native North Americans because finding them would corroborate all previous work. When I sequenced larger fragments and I was looking for the sites that I know are characteristic of Native American haplogroups, um, I was surprised because I did not find them. In contrast to all previous findings, Lorenz couldn't confirm the Windover people were Americans. Further investigation revealed something even more remarkable. I went back to the screen and I looked at the sequences again. The first person's DNA, it looked European. When I looked at the second one, it looked European. When I looked at the third, fourth, and fifth, they were slightly different from the first two, but they looked European. Lorenz had found DNA unlike any other from Native Americans. The word Mecca is rooted in the words Ol Mech and Mech Sako. In fact, when Europeans first arrived, the native Floridians even had a massive quote-unquote mosque made from stone in Florida named Tolo Mecco. Unsurprisingly, the words Muskogee, Musquaki, and Mascogo all bear the word mosque within them. For those that don't know, officially, Seminoles are Native Americans mixed with both runaway slaves and Irish, Scottish, and Welsh renegades, often bearing names like Mick and Mac. But we are told it is a coincidence that this tribe goes by the name Mikkosuki. Mikko is the same phonetic thread from which we get mezzo, mezzo, mexo, and yes, mecca. Cuba is the Kaaba, the land of the cube. The island of Cuba is actually the tail of the largest Q in the world. Its name is no coincidence. Many Seminoles escaped persecution to Cuba and settled there, some temporarily and others permanently. Cuba is also the name of a city in Alabama, Muscogee Territory. Q is the letter which represents fertilization. It displays an egg being actively fertilized by a sperm. The letter Q will be the topic of a later video. This letter of fertilization symbolizes the amniotic waters of the Gulf Stream, which perpetually emit from the Gulf of Mexico. It is the Gulf Stream and its destinations alone which survive the periods of mass freezing in the Northern Hemisphere. In periods of temperance, such as our current age, the Gulf Stream supplies warm, nourishing waters to northern locations that would otherwise not be able to host the vegetation they do today, such as Iceland and Helsinki. We will return to the Gulf Stream later in this presentation.
Did you know that in the exact same regions of America, where we find Moorish architecture and Moorish looking people, we also find a plethora of biblical place names as well as Moorish insignia on flags and crests? The following states all belonged to Muscogee or Creek territory. Florida, with its overtly Moorish architecture in all corners of the state, has cities with names such as Baghdad, Crescent City, Golden Crescent, Ta'alahasi, a city which has been referred to as the Rome, Jerusalem, and Athens of ancient America by multiple scholars. Moorhaven, Isla Morada, Arcadia, New Smyrna, Marathon, Zephyr Hills, Naples, Venice, St. Petersburg, Ala Chua, Baal County, El Portal, El Hardin, Garden Nile, Yalafa, Alafaya, Malabar, and many more. In Georgia, named for the same George as the country Georgia, previously part of both the Ottoman and Tartarian empires, we also find a plethora of Moorish architecture, as well as cities with names like Bethlehem, Athens, Hephseba, Rome, Salem, Smyrna, Cairo, Arabi, Zebulon, The Rock, Albany, al Foreto, Alapaha, Hiram, Jackin, Zion, Moorland, Ephesus, Ta'alapusa, Ta'alas, and O Mecca. In Al Abama, with its distinctly Arabic prefix, we find cities such as Arab, Andalusia, Athens, Dothan, Joppa, Sardis City, Boaz, Troy, Alexandria, Alexander City, Al Abaster, Al Tuna, At Ala, Ta'ala Dega, and Mobila the true name for mobile, which is actually Alabama backwards, and of course a plethora of Moorish architecture. In Mississippi, the land of the River Isis, we find Mount Olive, Carthage, Beulah, Gilead, and another Athens. In Tennessee, Medina, Memphis, Athens, Carthage, Alexandria, Moscow, Smyrna, Ta'alasi. South Carolina, which was initially part of Spanish La Florida, touts the unmistakably Arab crescent moon as its flag to this very day. We are told originated as a confederate symbol. In Louisiana, where the River Isis terminates, we find Amite, New Iberia, Lake Morepas, Des Alemans, Ala, Arcadia, Athens, Homer, Alexandria, Iota, Sicily, Delhi, Venice. Did you know, however, that New Orleans, the mouth of the River Isis, is nicknamed Crescent City? They say this is due to a crescent-shaped bend in the river, but this excuse is nonsense. Old sewer lids from the city displaying Islamic iconography easily debunk this. Arkansas, named for the ancient wooden ark ships which traced its abundant Mississippian coastline, contains the most biblical city names of any American state. In this one state we find Antioch, Athens, Bethel, Bethlehem, Beulah, Canaan, Beulah, Canaan, Corinth, Damascus, Egypt, Gethsemane, Goshen, Hebron, Jericho, Jerusalem, Jordan, Lebanon, Mount Judah, Mount Nebo, Mount Olive, Nimrod, Palestine, Four Salems, Four Shilohs, Siloam, 
Smyrna, Zion, Lepanto, and my favorite, the most telling of all, Ark Adelphia. Texas is the Lone Star State. That Lone Star is either Sirius, the star in the east, or Venus, the morning star, both of which are especially revered by Islam and trade places as the star in the clutches of the crescent moon. South Carolina is the crescent, and Texas is the star. In Texas, we find Palestine, Iran, Memphis, Abilene, Hebron, Nazareth, Daalas, Alamo, Odessa, Athens, Zephyr, Rome, Corsicana, and Ahamuda. You may have noticed an abundance of Greek names like Smyrna, Philadelphia, Arcadia, etc. Do you think it is any coincidence that every single state previously under native Creek territory has a city by the Greek name of Athens? Well, what if I told you that Creek is the same word as Greek? That may sound like a leap, but many researchers have remarked on the perplexing yet undeniable Greek contribution to native languages of the American Southeast. We will return to the topic of Greek presence in pre-Columbian Florida later on. Part 2. Giants and Old Men of Renown Amorites and Canaanites When Dr. Pedro de Santander wrote the following to his king in July of 1557, he used a very interesting choice of words to describe the people of Florida. It is lawful that your majesty, like a good shepherd appointed by the hand of the Eternal Father, should tend and lead out your sheep, since the Holy Spirit has shown spreading pastures whereon are feeding lost sheep, which have been snatched away by the dragon, the demon. These pastures are the new world, wherein is comprised Florida, now in possession of the demon, and here he makes himself adored and revered. This is the land of promise possessed by idolaters. The Amorite, Amalekite, Moabite, Canaanite. This is the land promised by the Eternal Father to the faithful. Since we are commanded by God in the Holy Scriptures to take it from them, being idolaters, and by reason of their idolatry and sin, to put them all to the knife, leaving no living things save maidens and children. Their cities robbed and sacked, their walls and houses leveled to the earth." End quote. Robbing, sacking, and leveling is exactly what the Spanish would do in Florida for a period of about 300 years. But let's take a look at those specific names used to describe native Floridians. Amorite, Amalekite, Moabite, and Canaanite. These are the very names used in the Old Testament to describe the ancient tribes of what we are today told is Arabia, the Holy Lands, Phoenicia, and Africa. So, was Dr. Pedro poetically employing these names simply for dramatic effect, or was he candidly relaying accurate information to his monarch, albeit with religious fervor? I tend to agree with the latter. The price for misleading a king was severe back in those days so I have a hard time looking past these revelatory titles. And believe me, slanderous labels such as Canaanite were not needed to justify crimes the Spanish were already accustomed to committing. Amorite is a very revealing word as it is nearly synonymous with Phoenician and more. One could even make the case that the word America comes from the word Amuri, the homeland of the Amorites. According to academia, Canaan, believed to be modern-day Israel and Lebanon, is the alleged homeland of the Phoenicians. Though certainly a Phoenician colony, I do not believe it to be their homeland. The original Phoenicians, who were actually Finnish, come from the true North Pole, near Helsinki, Finland. Nonetheless, Norse seafarers were in Florida thousands of years before the dawn of Egypt's first dynasty. This is substantiated by the European DNA recovered from the Florida bog bodies. These burials are identical to ones in Scandinavia, 
but academia does absolutely nothing to address this fact. The following articles highlight the ample evidence of Phoenician presence in the pre-Columbian Americas. Giants of old. Is wordplay all we have to back up our theory? Absolutely not. There are two issues that scholars shy away from entirely when trying to pinpoint the cradle of civilization. The first of these issues is the fact that men of immense stature, titans even, were known to exist in the aforementioned lands during biblical times. The Anakim are the most commonly referenced giants in the Bible. The Anakim dwelled in Moab, Canaan, and the surrounding areas. But as we just heard, those lands may very well be Florida. The word Anakim can even be linked with the name Abanakis, an ancient mound building culture from Sarasota, Florida, which bears the same root as Sarah Sin, a medieval name for Muslims. Believe it or not, while rich in archaeological findings in general, the Middle East does not yield as many skeletons of impressive stature, nor are the people currently dwelling there of any noteworthy height. Quite the opposite, actually. E.E. E. Calloway had the following to say in regards to America's forgotten legacy. With the exception of the Aztecs, we have erroneously assumed that all the peoples who lived in the Western Hemisphere before the white man came here were Indians. We now know that is not true, but that a large, non-warlike people lived here even before the Indians, and that their physical attributes, habits, and manner of living were as different from the Indians as the Indians differ from the white man. We have also erroneously assumed that this is the New World, and that Asia is the Old World. From the skeletons of the giants and evidence of their great works in Mexico and Peru, and from the ancient temples and ruins of the Western Hemisphere, I am convinced that the genesis of man was in the Western Hemisphere, and not in Asia. Some of the skeletons uncovered in the Western Hemisphere became skeletons before man even learned the art of embalming or mummifying." End quote. Some may think the concept of giant humans is entirely fantasy, but this could not be further from the truth. The United States, with Florida in particular, bears an alarming amount of quote-unquote giant skeletons. It would be impossible to list all the known records of unusually large bones found in the southeastern United States between the years 1860 and 1960 alone. To list those in Florida would require hours of narration, for the sake of brevity, we will skim through a selection of articles from one publication alone, the Tampa Bay Times, and its subsidiaries, between the years 1890 and 1960. This should emphasize just how prevalent giant men were in pre-Columbian America. On the 6th of September, 1914, the Tampa Bay Times printed the following title, Bones of Real Giants Found. These averaged over seven feet in height. In 1922, Big Mound Yields Giant Skeleton. This specimen actually measured over nine feet in length. In 1925, Skeletal Remains of Giant Discovered. In 1927, Amateur Archaeologists Find Remains of Florida Giants Near Fort Myers. In 1955, Who Were the Glades Giants? Were they born that way, or did ancient Indians use bone-stretching formula? Dozens of articles reflect the same findings in the mounds of Florida. Keep in mind, all of these skeletons were uncovered within about 70 years of each other, in Florida alone. Unfortunately, virtually all of these bones excavated from the mounds of Florida were handed over to the Smithsonian, where they have been kept from the public's attention ever since thus helping to shift the public's perception of giants from reality to fantasy. 
But do we have any evidence of living, breathing giants in Florida? The answer is yes. The Tamukua civilization, who ranged from the Tampa Bay area to modern South Carolina, were some of the very first natives encountered by the Spanish and French conquistadors. The French had the following to say in regards to this tribe's extraordinary height. This chief, Athor, is an extremely handsome man, intelligent, reliable, strong, of exceptional height, exceeding our tallest men by a foot and a half, and endowed with a certain restrained dignity, so that in him a remarkable majesty shone forth." End quote. I have found evidence that the tallest man on the French expedition stood around six foot three. This would make the Tamukua close to eight feet tall. Even in a scenario where the tallest French was only five foot six, this would still make the Tamukua seven feet tall. It should be noted that not all native Floridians were giants. Even the Tamukua were a group of tribes primarily united by language alone. Thus, when the Spanish arrived, they gave a more moderate but still impressive height for a separate branch of the Tamukua, saying that they averaged at least a full four inches taller than Europeans. It should also be noted that the height of the Tamukua fell considerably after their integration into Spanish missions, indicating that they were malnourished. The Carib people, from which we get the name Caribbean Sea, inhabited the West Indies and parts of Florida. The Caribs, though likely a title encompassing many different tribes, were also said to average seven feet tall at the time of Spanish arrival. Remember the Seminoles of Florida, who also go by the name Creek, Muskegee, and Miccosukee? Well, despite their little understood genetic makeup, the average height for a seminal man in the 1950s was six foot four, with many individuals surpassing that height. To find seminal men under six foot was highly unusual, and such outliers were likely adopted into the tribe during later conflicts, and therefore not representative of the tribe's true height. The following article of the Tampa Bay Times, dated January 10, 1960, addresses this peculiarity. Indians were six feet tall. Not as an anthropologist, but as a layman who knows personally many of the present-day Seminoles, Mr. Devane lists those he knows to be six feet or taller. And Billy Bowlegs III adds the names of others who have passed on to their happy hunting grounds. Chipko was about six foot, two or three inches tall. His brother, who was the first chief of the Seminoles in Oklahoma, called Long John, was six feet six inches tall. His brother, who was the father of Chief Ta'alahasi, was over six feet. His niece, Martha Tiger, was almost six feet, and of the three Tom Tigers, all were over six feet. Captain Tom Tiger was six foot six inches and weighed almost 300 pounds, according to his son Naha, who had recently died. Billy Bowlegs III, said these Seminoles, now deceased, were six feet and over. Old Cypress Charlie and his four sons, Whitney, Wilson, Futch, and Charlie Cypress, Old Charlie and son, Sam Huff, Big Charlie, six feet four, Coffee Gopher, Tom Jumper, Josie Jumper, Charlie Peacock and his brother, John, Tommy Doctor and Jimmy Doctor. Those living whom I can recall are Reverend Henry Cypress, six feet four, Sam Tony. Jack, John, and Frank Tommy, and their grandfather, Old Tom, Jumper, Tom, and Morgan Smith, the largest man among the Seminoles, Joe and Toby Johns, Willie and John Henry Gopher, Johnny Jash and his son. Only a few of the older deceased have been mentioned, but the present-day Seminoles are, to me, evidence that there have been, and now are, many who are large and some very tall. A few years ago, former Sheriff Wiggins of Glades County built a home on a mound within his pasture. The site is about three miles from the old ceremonial mound near Fort Center on Fish Eating Creek, which is the highest soil mound in Glades or Highlands County. 
This mound was in the marsh, and evidently was a burial mound. When excavating for the foundation and septic tank, he uncovered large leg and arm bones. He estimated the people were near seven feet tall. There seems to be ample evidence that Florida was once populated with many very large and tall people. End quote. So, to whose genes do the Seminole tribe owe their impressive height? To the New World? To the Old World? Or perhaps an even older world? Academia seems to have no interest whatsoever in such a line of inquiry. Long life in Florida. If you remember, I said there were two issues which academia refuses to address. The first is the presence of giants in the Bible. The second is this. The inhabitants of Mesopotamia in the Old Testament were explicitly said to have reached hundreds and hundreds of years of age. Adam, for example, lived to 930 years old. His descendants had an equally impressive lifespan. That is until after the flood, when God restricted man's lifespan to 120 years. 120 years of age is the generally accepted maximum age for today's humanity. Well, the aforementioned Temucua were not only giant in stature, but could apparently live to over 300 years of age. This is explicitly conveyed in the following account of the expedition led by French Huguenot René Goulain de Laudonnaire in 1564. However, although they hold great feasts in their own way, they are temperate in their eating, and as a result of which they live for a long time. For one of their chiefs assured me that he was 300 years old, and that his father, whom he showed me, was 50 years older than he. And I can truly say that when I saw him, I thought I was looking at no more than human bones covered with skin. They certainly put Christians to shame, who reduced their span of life by holding immoderate feasts and drinking parties, and who deserve to be handed over for training to these base, uncivilized people and brutish creatures in order to learn restraint. The average life expectancy of a quote-unquote full-blooded Florida Seminole prior to their total Americanization was well over 90 years. This lifespan is much older than that of European settlers, but is even more impressive when considering these towering men and women lived outdoors 24-7, with no air conditioning, no grocery store, no refrigerator, no cars, kitchen sink, no first aid, no hospital, no vitamins. Just the Florida sun, Florida air, and Florida spring water. Quote-unquote natives are not the only people to experience prolonged life as a result of time spent in Florida, however. John Gomez, a Seminole War veteran, ex-pirate, celebrity recluse, and nephew to the famed buccaneer Jose Gaspar, was aged somewhere between 116 and 140 years old before passing away in Florida. He was believed to be the oldest living American citizen and was recorded in one official census as being 125 years old. Many people believe his involvement with Florida piracy points to a possible connection with the Fountain of Youth. You may be surprised to hear that the life of John Gomez helped to inspire the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. In 1957, the Tampa Tribune reported the case of Charlie Smith, who was then aged 115 years old, and received his social security check reflecting such. It should be noted that Charlie never retired. Being sold into slavery around age 12, he picked Florida oranges seven days a week and had done so for over a hundred years. Charlie Smith is said to have been born in Liberia in 1842 and did not pass away until October 5, 1979, making him 137 years old. Despite being accused of embellishing his life story, Smith's minimum verifiable age at the time of his death was 105. Why would a 100-year-old man need to lie about his age? That sounds like the type of unwanted attention that black men of that era, ex-slaves in particular, were not eager to attract. 
On a side note, Smith's status as a popular moon landing denier may have caused the attacking of his veracity by the mainstream. Charlie Smith was just one of dozens of centenarians in Florida, studied by the distinguished esoteric author George Clements, who often wrote under the name Hilton Hotima. Clements was one of Earth's only true experts on longevity, and dedicated the second half of his life to rectifying man's misconceptions about lifespan. His wonderful book, Long Life in Florida, professes the climate and produce found here to be the most life-sustaining in the world. This conclusion was not arrived at hastily. Clements spent ample time in the tropics of the Pacific, as well as every corner of the United States. Clements lived to 91, subsisting off little other than unpasteurized Florida orange juice for the second half of his life. And he was in phenomenal shape, built very sturdy well into old age. Some believe his life was actually cut short early due to his revolutionary teachings. Another aspect to the Garden of Eden which cannot be ignored is the Fountain of Youth. Though not explicitly named in the Bible, we must remember that the Garden of Eden myth was directly inspired by multiple pre-existing pagan legends. Virtually all of these legends feature life-giving waters, typically in the form of a spring, fountain, or river. Such mythical waters were believed to prolong life, restore youth, cure disease, and bless or protect the user. While widespread among many cultures, this myth was most equated with Greek, Mesopotamian, and Floridian lore. Uncoincidentally, the same three cultures between which we have been establishing a firm connection in Florida and the Gulf. We are told the Moors brought the concept of the Fountain of Youth to Europe, and thus the Spanish took the legend of Florida. However, the native people of Florida already possessed a similar myth themselves. If the Moors brought the myth to Spain, then who could have already brought it to Florida? It should be noted here that yes, there are a myriad of allegorical and transcendental interpretations for the fountain myth and related legends like the Elixir of Life, Atlantis, Eden, etc., none of which have been overlooked in this assessment. I would like to remind those listeners that allegory does not negate the literal interpretation of any story. It merely adds another dimension to it. For example, English kings did not cease to exist when they were depicted fictionally in Shakespeare's plays, nor did Egypt after being mentioned in the Bible. Those who use allegory to knock down any literal interpretation that threatens their perceived intellectual superiority have clearly missed the purpose of allegory altogether. Regardless, the one place on this earth that is most associated with a physical fountain of youth is Florida. Even before the Spanish had set foot on the peninsula, its reputation as a land of healing waters had preceded it. But when the conquistadors penetrated inland, they would come to realize what most Floridians today do not even know, for it is a well-kept secret. Florida has the highest concentration of freshwater springs in the world. Not only is this a fact, but Florida puts other locations abundant in spring water to shame in terms of consistency, magnitude, and span of subterranean networks. The entirety of Florida rests upon a 100,000 square mile aquifer composed of Paleocene carbonate rock. This aquifer, called the Florida Aquifer, supplies the freshest water known to man directly from its subterranean source to over a thousand notable springheads in the state of Florida alone, and many more in parts of Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Magnitude is the metric used to rank the flow of springheads. There are more high magnitude springs in the state of Florida alone than any single country in the world. Let that sink in. Why would God place such an excessive number of springs in one location? Probably because he wanted to ensure Adam and Eve would never know the meaning of thirst. To act as though the gushing, crystal springs of Florida's inland were not the exact fountain for which Juan Ponce de Leon was searching 
is folly. We are erroneously told that the natives fingered Bimini as the true fountain of youth, but this could not be so, as the Bahamas, while lush and beautiful, are very lacking in spring water. Fresh spring water was the lifeblood of paradise. Spain must have evidently found this fountain, for they would cling to Florida for another 300 years, despite its complete lack of gold and silver, and overall treasure when compared to other Spanish colonies. The Spanish, like the natives, were known to praise the healing qualities of Florida's springs. In fact, they, like subsequent American settlers, would bottle this medicinal water and sell it around the world for a high price. Did you know Florida is littered with the ruins of a golden age of hydropathy? Some of these ruins actually look near identical to artistic interpretations of the original Fountain of Youth. Unbeknownst to many Americans, spring water tourism was actually the number one draw for visitors traveling to Florida before the 1929 stock market collapse. Hundreds of thousands of people would flock to this state every year just to drink and bathe in its spring water. The rise of halopathy via the Rockefeller-funded medical cartel and pharmaceutical industry have ceased all serious scientific consideration of the healing properties of Florida spring water. This topic is discussed in my Fountain of Youth video. It must also be said that the Yucatan Peninsula is home to an abundance of springs. While exemplary of the fertile crescent, there is a higher frequency of hot springs in this region, wonderfully healing but not preferable for drinking. The beautiful cenotes of Mexico are only partially fed by springs, and are more often basins which collect filtered rainwater. Florida is also home to the largest, deepest, and highest magnitude freshwater spring known to man. Wakula Springs. Wakula, like most other springs in Florida, is a treasure trove of ancient skeletons and artifacts. A common motif found in mythical paradises is their proximity to the underworld. For example, the Garden of Hesperides, from which we get the Garden of Eden and the word paradise, was said to have rested directly above Hades, the underworld. The river Styx, which gave Achilles his blessings of protection, flowed upward from Hades. Nine separate species of extinct mammals have been found in the springs, 12 plus miles of underwater caves. Actually, a majority of Florida is networked by subterranean rivers and caverns. Talk about an underworld. Springs like these are quite literally a window into the prehistoric world. In fact, Megalodon, Giant Sloth, Mastodon, and mammoth bones, as well as many others, are routinely discovered in Florida waters by amateurs. Unlike dinosaurs, which are primarily dug for intentionally in pre-designated dig sites with millions of dollars in funding, the bones of many giant humans have been retrieved from these underwater caverns. Both Florida spring water and Florida swamp water 
which contains little to no oxygen and is naturally alkaline, have the perfect conditions for long-term preservation of fossils. Would it not make sense that when ingested, Florida spring water could have a similar anti-aging effect on a living body? It is accepted that at one time in Florida, a quote-unquote water mortuary cult saw prominence across the state. Sites such as Fort Center, the Windover Bog, Minnesota Key Offshore Site, and many others show a tendency for natives to inter their dead in shallow, mucky ponds, which, as mentioned earlier, can preserve tissue and DNA for a minimum of 7,000 years. Florida, being paradise, sits atop Hades, both geologically and geographically. The only true geological candidate for a literal river Styx is the vast network of underwater caves running underneath Florida. It's quite surprising how few Floridians know how expansive of an underworld sits beneath their feet. It must be said that no such substantial subterranean waterways exist in Greece or in Mesopotamia, and to this day, clean drinking water is scarce in these regions. Geographically speaking, Florida also quite literally sits atop Hades, for Haiti is Hades. With all due respect to the Haitian people, the parallels between Haiti and the underworld are numerous. Haiti is a land of difficulty, constantly at the mercy of earthquakes and natural disasters. There was also a Punic colony, which means Phoenician, by the name of Gades, which, according to Pliny's natural history, was said to be called the Isle of Juno by its natives. Florida actually has a city named Juno Beach. This colony, erroneously attributed to Cadiz, Spain, was very likely the Caribbean Sea, possibly Haiti. Keep in mind the letter G goes soft and sounds like an H in multiple languages. But as with most things Phoenician, our mainstream academia tends to just fling shit at a wall and see what sticks. Part 3. Noah's Ark Another absurdity furthered by the mainstream is the idea that Noah's Ark landed in the same general vicinity from which it departed. This buffoonery has rarely, if ever, been questioned by academics or theologists. Contrary to popular belief, the flood of Noah did not last for 40 days. While the rain is said to have lasted for 40 days, the entire duration of Noah's time in the ark ranged from a minimum of 150 days to a maximum of 371 days. We are expected to believe that during months and months on the most tumultuous open seas man has ever known, as the entire surface of the planet was being reshaped, Noah's boat seemed to hover perfectly in place before approaching what was already the closest, highest area in the region. For those that don't know, the Ark is said to have only moved from Iraq to its next door neighbor, Armenia. There is little to no possibility of this having happened. Such a short distance traveled is uncharacteristic of such an amount of time spent adrift. And if the Ark was indeed navigable, would they not have approached this familiar high ground sooner? When considering the Islamic account, the truth is even more evident. According to the Quran, a single giant was permitted to board the ark and survive the flood. As we have pointed out, Florida was a land of giants. But here is the true giveaway. Noah's ark is said to have left Mesopotamia, floated considerably south to Mecca, then circled the Kaaba, LOL, before heading back north past where it started, then farther north to its landing place in Turkey. Allow me to propose a more likely chain of events. The Ark, constructed in the Apalachicola River area of Florida, was located either there or on the Mississippi River near Arkansas when the flood commenced. From there, the Ark traveled to Mexico, not Mecca, carrying at least one Florida giant, then circled around what portion of Cuba, the Caba, was sticking out of the ocean. From there, the ark drifted out to the open sea, and as the water levels rose, 
it would have no problem passing over Africa, the Middle East, then to its resting place, either in Turkey or Armenia, in which case we could call it Armenia. It was loaded, and then it floated five months and landed on Mount Ard, where we know definitely that it's now embedded in the ice. Regardless of faith, there is an overwhelming consensus that Noah's Ark landed either on Mount Ararat or the mountains of Ararat. This is strongly substantiated by the presence of ancient stone anchors, drogues, and ballasts high up in these mountains, where they do not belong. Does Ararat, North Carolina, also in the Appalachian Mountains, fit into this picture? Well, that's a rabbit hole for another video. How do we know the Ark was constructed in the Apalachicola River area? Well, if you remember, we discussed earlier how Christian theologian E. E. Calloway, with the help of a few experts, was able to identify 27 of the 28 trees mentioned in the Bible, right here in Florida, along the Apalachicola River. But the most significant of all his findings was three logs of petrified gopher wood each measuring 6 to 8 feet by 20 inches, consistent with the three missing planks of Noah's Ark. The tree life from Chattahoochee to Bristol is the largest of any other area in the world. The Bible names 28 trees. The best authority on earth have identified 27 of them here, and many, many more, including the gopher wood tree. Well, not only are we sitting in the Garden of Eden, but we're also sitting in an area where you say Noah built the ark. Noah built the ark out of gopher wood, which God selected himself for him to build it out of. Is this the only place that this you know This is of? the only place on this earth where it has ever grown. It's the most peculiar wood on earth. You can take a piece of it the size of this match when it's green. You can't break it. You can twist it and turn it. It's the lightest wood on earth. I have had its fibers, its structure, its uh, every phase of it chemically analyzed. There's no other wood on earth like it. It's the lightest. And Noah built the ark out of wood not very far from you, where you and I are sitting here at Torreya State Park. Calloway had already suspected the Florida Torreya of being the gopher wood mentioned in the Old Testament from which Noah built the majority of the ark. But when he discovered these three petrified logs, he was certain of it. The logs of petrified gopher wood which Callaway discovered here, he said, were sawed off good and smooth, just like a chainsaw would have done. One of the plant's rarest trees, the Florida Torreya, also known as gopher wood, is endemic to only a small stretch of the Apalachicola River. Believe it or not, a lone torreya was planted outside the Florida State Capitol in Tallahassee in 1835, where it stood until the 1970s when it was removed in order to build a new courthouse. Isn't that saying something considering this city in ancient times has been likened to Rome, Athens, and Jerusalem? Now that we have our building material, what else would Noah's Ark need? Anchors, of course. Were you aware that the Tampa Bay area is home to the oldest and largest ancient stone anchors ever discovered? Is it not undeniable that the oldest and largest stone anchors ever would belong to the oldest and largest maritime culture ever? Before the advent of the iron anchor, the go-to material for ancient anchors was stone. 
In all the regions where we know ancient maritime cultures to have existed, we find stone anchors in the archaeological record. Typically, ancient stone anchors are found in the Mediterranean Sea and Austronesia, and they average around 50 to 300 pounds. Some larger vessels would use anchors as heavy as 500 pounds, but these would require at least three men to hoist and thus would likely remain in the water even when not deployed. The ancient stone anchors you are seeing here on the streets of Pinellas, Pasco, and Hillsborough counties, Florida, generally weigh between 5,000 and 10,000 pounds. The two largest stones we encountered could easily weigh 15,000 pounds. The Tampa Tribune ran the following article regarding these ancient stone anchors. There, wedged deep in the grass of the median on Daly Lane, about 150 yards from the Pitla Chascati River, sits a massive stone with two holes, both 17 and a half inches in diameter. Bill Donato, an archaeologist and expert on stone anchors, said it clearly was an artificial formation with distinct rope grooves running through both holes and other properties that show it may have been used as an anchor or mooring stone. The size is astounding, Donato says, far bigger than anything I've seen. It may have been a mooring stone. The Romans used circles set this way. It's also a similar shape to Carthaginian findings." End quote. Can you see why the mainstream refuses to even acknowledge the existence of these ancient stone anchors? Giant anchors mean giant boats, giant people, and giant deceptions in our history books. Over 2,000 of these giant anchors have been discovered along the west coast of Florida, with the highest concentration in Pinellas and Pasco counties. Pinellas County is the land of Peniel, mentioned in the Bible, sharing the same root word as pineal. Though these stones are scattered in all parts of Florida, they are mostly found along the west coast, from Tampa Bay up to the Apalachicola River, precisely where E.E. E. Calloway says arcs of biblical proportion were being constructed. To date, these anchors are the most tangible evidence ever presented in the search for Atlantis. But what does Atlantis have to do with Eden? Well, as John Saxer of Tarpon Springs, Florida has pointed out in his decades of research, they are in fact the same myth. The Garden of Eden is taken from the Greek myth, the Garden of Hesperides, from which we get the word paradise. Mythologers and philosophers alike have long placed the Garden of the Hesperides in close proximity to Atlantis, with some believing the two to be synonymous. Seeing as how the Hesperides are nicknamed the Atlantides, Atlas is the central male figure of both these legends, and was the direct inspiration for the biblical Adam. From the dragon Laden, usually depicted as a snake, guarding the golden apples in the Garden of Hesperides, we get the serpent tending the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. Eve represents the three daughters of the evening, the three Hesperides. The fall of man is a personified account of the fall of Atlantis. Anchors are not the only evidence presented by John in the case for Eden and Atlantis. Central Florida, Tarpon Springs included, is the sinkhole capital of the world. Gaping sinkholes play a central role in many Greek myths, primarily that of Persephone and Hades, but do not occur in Greece, with anywhere near their frequency in Florida. But why are we again calling upon Greek myth to substantiate our claims? I will tell you. The town which has the most giant stone anchors is Tarpon Springs, Florida. Tarpon Springs is the most Greek city in America. This is established fact. Atlantis is a Greek myth. It was John Saxer who pieced these two clues together after moving to the area 30 years ago. He had already been a pyramidologist, Egyptologist, and psychic archaeologist for 10 years before relocating to Tarpon. John Saxer was actually 
the very first person to recognize the ancient stone anchors of Florida for what they were. It is for this reason that they are now referred to as the Saxer Stones. For those who have not seen my documentaries about John, the Saxer Stones, and the Saxer Saga, the links are in the description. Saxer points to the anomalous number of Greeks living in Tarpon Springs as clear evidence of a Floridian origin for many Greek myths. Is it any coincidence that the supposed location of the Greek Garden of Hesperides was named Tartesso, erroneously believed to be in modern-day Spain? Can you guess what Tartesso, Tarpon Springs, Tartaria, Tartarus, and the seminal Tarton all have in common? The fabled islands of Tortuga also come to mind, especially since they are featured in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. The closest known word to Tartesso is the Italian word Tortesso, meaning cakey. Cakey is actually a perfect geological description of Florida. After all, the Greeks believe themselves to have come from an Atlantis in the west, beyond the Pillars of Hercules. But I would like your opinion. Which set of land masses looks more like two pillars? The Straits of Gibraltar or Florida and the Yucatan? I side with the latter. Ironically, the Straits of Florida and Key West were named the Gibraltar of the West. John believes the Greek to possess an innate heightened psychic ability, and thus, like salmon, have returned to their spawning point. We are told the Greeks only settled Tarpon Springs in the 1890s for the sole purpose of sponge fishing. However, on the other coast of Florida, we have an even earlier Greek colony which did no sponge fishing at all. New Smyrna, named for the ancient Greek city of Smyrna in modern-day Turkey, was allegedly founded in 1768. It is not common knowledge in Florida that a portion of the east coast was once a Greco-Turkish colony. This colony comprised of 1,400 Ottoman and colonists, about 500 of which were full-blooded Greeks. Believe it or not, this was the single largest attempted settlement in North America to yet occur. However, this colony would fail. We're given little information as to what happened to those Greeks afterwards. Ottomans and Greeks in Florida before America had even become a country. If you remember, we were making a case for a Greek presence in pre-Columbian Florida, with the undeniable link between Greek-Ottoman culture and native Creek and Ottomangian culture. We are now ever closer to the substance of such a theory. Perhaps the world needs to re-examine what it means to be a Greek. After all, in the words of Alexander the Great, for me, Every virtuous foreigner is a Greek. Part 4. Why would they lie? When the idea or the notion or the belief that the Garden of Eden was somewhere else or over in Europe or, so, or in Africa or someplace over there, the Western Hemisphere was unknown. They did not know that the continent existed west of the Atlantic Ocean. Therefore, they couldn't search this continent along with the others to find the river of foreheads and these other great natural monuments which the Bible said was related to the Garden of Eden. It came my pleasure and my responsibility and my duty to search the North American continent and definitely point out the same bare natural monuments that the Bible relates to. It suffices here to answer the question which must have popped into your head by now. Why would they lie? The Out of Africa theory is a complete propaganda campaign, promoted as fact in accordance with a sinister political agenda. Historical occurrences such as Atlantis and Eden must be labeled as pure fiction by the current academic regime in order to protect their holy grail of monkey-based Darwinism from any honest criticism. Egypt's cultural debt to Africa is exaggerated by the mainstream, while its undeniable Atlantean heritage is suppressed. Ancient Egypt is therefore seen as the necessary crux upon which the out-of-Africa theory rests. 
However, Egyptology has long held a reputation as an industry of rampant corruption and charlatanism. Please ask yourself, how is it that the artifacts and figurines of a single ancient culture like Egypt, a country hardly larger than Texas, line the walls of the archaeological wing of virtually every major museum on the planet? Yet the archaeological findings of the United States, with ten times the total land area of modern-day Egypt, and teeming with thousands of ancient burials, most of which remain unexcavated, but are known to be filled with skeletons, artifacts, and treasures, are not even given the time of day in its own national museums. Are we really so naive to accept that Africa, Asia, Europe, South America, and even Mexico all possessed sophisticated empires responsible for the technological advancement of the collective human species. But the ancient cultures of the United States have nothing to offer the world except ghost stories and buffalo bones. Many people are simply not aware of how much money is raked in by these desert-stricken countries due to a handful of buried cities. I will have the listener know the Southeast United States alone contains more sites of archaeological significance than the entire Middle East combined. The distinction is this. The Middle East, assumed to be the birthplace of the Abrahamic religions, offers its archaeological booty openly to international researchers, scholars, and quackademics. With little to no ethical consideration, Whereas the thousands of pyramids, mummies, mounds, temples, extensive earthworks, tunnel networks, etc., found within the United States are all, without exception, protected under pseudo-spiritual consideration for tribes who often bear zero genetic affiliation with the titanic races who actually left them. It should not need saying that such double standards are entirely political in origin and are not at all consistent with the approaches taken by experts in other countries. Regardless of what you think about the Mormon faith, their views on American history deserve some serious consideration. For those that don't know, Mormonism teaches that much of the Old Testament actually occurred in America. The Mormon Wars, a series of conflicts fought between the United States and Mormons between 1838 and 1866, would serve to cement the United States' attitude towards all American-centric historical revisionism. All references of Moors and Venetians in Florida were to be treated as Spanish cultural aesthetic, nothing more. The word reset is used in the historical context to denote a point in time where history was largely suppressed, destroyed, or rewritten to the benefit of a single party. These often coincide with periods of political destabilization or cataclysm. In Florida, we have four such instances of political destabilization via four complete transfers of power. Firstly, from the native inhabitants to the bloodthirsty, zealous Spanish conquistadors funded by the Catholic crown with instructions to kill, convert, and enslave in around 1513. In 1763, Florida changed hands to the only empire capable of rivaling the Spanish in number of atrocities committed, the British. The Brits immediately sought to re-enslave the high number of colored peoples who found refuge in Spanish Florida, thus erasing 250 years of racial rapport between whites, blacks, and quote-unquote natives thrusting the state back into disarray. In 1784, Florida was ceded back to the Spanish, who held on to it until 1819, when it was practically given to the United States for free. From there, this is what happened. America takes part in the Barbary Wars, fighting Moorish pirates, emerges victorious. Then the U.S. Navy sails to Key West and enacts martial law to combat piracy. Then, the U.S. immediately begins fighting Moorish-looking Seminoles in Florida. Then, the U.S. starts fighting the Mormons. But we are told these all had nothing to do with each other, not to mention the Civil War. 
On top of this, virtually every major city in Florida suffered catastrophic damage after the turn of the century, mostly by fire, such as the Great Fire of 1901, 1908, 1914, 1917, 1919, 1923, etc., or by hurricane, like those that devastated Florida in 1921, 1925, 1926, and 1928, as well as many, many others. I would wager some records were lost and some history was rewritten somewhere along the line, wouldn't you? Part 5, Florida's Destiny I would like to conclude with an excerpt written by T.J. Brooks found in Hilton Hotema's Long Life in Florida. Empire of the Sun Why is Florida destined to rise to greater heights than any other state of this nation? Because she has the same isothermal zone as did ancient Thebes and Luxor when they flourished in the valley of the mystic Nile. The same as that of Babylonia, the Magnificent, with her hanging gardens on the banks of the Euphrates, when she ruled a continent. The same as that of Jerusalem, the holy city of Palestine, with its fabulous wealth and templed shrines, when Solomon reigned in all his glory. The same as that of Athens, when she was the intellectual capital of the world, and crowned with the architectural splendor the hills of classic Greece. The same as that of Carthage, when she disputed the sovereignty of the world with imperial Rome. The same as that of Naples, nestling between Mount Vesuvius, topped with Delphic flames, and her beautiful bay of which the poet said, With dreamful eyes my spirit lies beneath the walls of paradise. Florida, where millions of fruit trees are bowed with golden globes, and ruddy moons and grapevines stagger with their own purple clusters. Where gardens furnish the tables of a nation with bounties of fresh food when frost locks the northern soils in ice. Florida, where palm trees bend to the ocean breeze and inland jungles show the same, primeval forests with flowing beards and druids of old. The same as they did when De Leon and De Soto penetrated them in the vain pursuit of gold and of the fabled fountain of youth. Florida, the sun parlor of a continent, the playground of the world, the birthplace of the nation, the empire of the sun. <laughs>